All right, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On the show with me today, we have a special guest, Colin McIntosh. Colin is the founder and CEO of Sheets and Giggles, a fast-growing direct-to-consumer brand in the $12 billion U.S. betting space. Launched on Indiegogo in 2018 with a $284,000 crowdfunding campaign, S&G has raised approximately $2 million in venture capital to date, and it is one of the few companies to make $1 million in revenue in its first 12 months of sales. S&G is also a sustainability brand as its eucalyptus bed sheets and duvet covers use up to 96% less water to make than cotton sheets and no insecticides or pesticides. Colin has been a guest on Shopify's official podcast and on other podcasts and radio interviews. Uh, Colin also regularly lob- lobbies for progressive issues and causes with a group of over 150 liberal Colorado business owners. Uh, Colin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Toby. I appreciate the warm intro, and you're making me making me blush over here. <laughs> um, well, tell me, tell me, like, what was originally the inspiration for uh, for wanting to do um, sheets and giggles? Tell me, like, was it? Have you been like interested in in doing like an environmentally sustainable company? Was that a key a key focus for you, or just tell me like how you originally came up with the idea? People ask, ask me that all the time, um, friends, family, strangers. Uh, and it, it, so I'm, it's funny. Everybody's like, Oh, are you like some type of like betting nut? Like, and I'm, you know, no, not at least I am now, but I didn't used to be. Um, and, uh, and I basically long story short, um, and this is a true story. Uh, I was watching the movie war dogs with miles Teller and Jonah Hill. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie. Uh, and Miles Teller's character is selling bed sheets out of the back of a pickup truck, and he's getting rejected left and right by all the retirement homes he's trying to sell them to. And I got so frustrated with this character. I, you know, he bought all this inventory. He didn't do any customer research, didn't understand his demographics, his value prop, didn't understand his pricing model. And I basically paused the movie, and I wrote a bed sheets company plan that night for <laughs> a business plan. And I, whenever I write a business plan, I always buy a domain. And I thought, what's a good name for a bedsheets company? And I kind of snapped my fingers and I said, Sheets and Giggles, that's a funny name. Uh, and so I bought SheetsGiggles.com. And uh, four months later, I ended up getting laid off from my job at 1 p.m. on a Monday, um, another startup. That's the way it goes sometimes. And, um, you know, it was pretty devastating emotionally. And, and I was thinking about what to do next. And I decided, you know what? Uh, let's do it now or never. I'm in my late 20s. I've got no, no major uh, commitments. Um, and, uh, let me go ahead and try to see if I can start my own company. And that's, that's how Sheets and Giggles was born. Awesome. Um, so tell me about kind of what, what, uh, what goes into, I guess the, um, I don't want to call it, uh, ingredients, but the, uh, the, <laughs> the eucalyptus, the bed sheets. tell me about like, uh, how it's different. I, as I mentioned in the, in the bio, it says, uh, uses 96% less water to make than cotton sheets. Um, so tell me about kind of uh, how you figured that out or, yeah. or came across that and then why uh, or how you were able to implement that. So so that figure is, is sort of a ballpark figure in terms of average traditional cotton production. And it's pretty well known at this point that the average, you know, cotton t-shirt can use up to like 2,500 liters of water. Um, and it ends up being a square yardage calculation where, you know, you can kind of uh, look into how much water per square yard, yard usage. And the average cotton set of bed sheets can use up to about 4,000 liters of water to make, um, whereas ours use in the hundreds, uh, low hundreds. So it's, it's something that, um, you know, uh, we're very proud of in terms of the environmental impact. It's not just the fresh water, though. It's also the fact that cotton can use up to 16 to 20 percent of the world's insecticides by itself um, as a single crop. And also cotton in the United States and in Asia uh, is a major user of a European banned insecticide called neonicotinoids, which are killing bird and bee populations. That's the main one responsible for the bird and bee population decline. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot of education that we try to do to people around what cotton actually does to our environment. Um, it also uses up a huge amount of the world's arable farmland. 
Um, and so, you know, whereas eucalyptus trees can be grown vertically, they can be branched, they, they're, they grow with maturity very quickly within a number of years. Um, and so uh, there's a bunch of pieces on the cotton side that we'd like to brag about. On the polyester side, that's what really gets me excited moving forward because the home textiles market is about two thirds polyester because it's so cheap, right? It's made from petrochemicals, made from oil. And so uh, compared to polyester, we don't use any, any petrochemicals um, and we don't shed any microplastics. Whereas a single polyester sheet set can shed up to 100 million microplastic fibers by itself through the laundry every single year, depending on how often you wash sheets. Uh, and so uh, that's something that I think is really something that we're gonna clue in on a little bit more. And then versus uh, bamboo, which you know is a different form of what's called cellulosic rayon, right? Fabric made from plants. There's bamboo viscose. There's eucalyptus lyocell. Um, it's an earlier version of the same process that we use, but it uses a, a chemical called carbon sulfide. Bamboo viscose does, and that can be harmful to workers and environments. Um, and depending on where it's made and the regulations around how it's made, that can often mean that it's being dumped in the waterways and ends up being a very large uh, polluter. Um, and so our, our process is a closed loop system. We use amine oxide instead of carbon sulfide for a solvent. Uh, it breaks down harmlessly uh, and we can reuse up to 99.5% of the chemicals in every batch of fiber production. Um, and it's considered to be one of the most sustainable methods of fiber production in the world. So are these, you, you kind of touched on the, the environmental uh, uh, risks, I guess, of using some of the like traditional methods like cotton. Are there also, does that also translate to like human health risks? Like, is, do we know anything about like, is that using <laughs> cotton bed sheets? Is that doing anything harmful for our health or? I, I don't want to say yes or no definitively in terms of the cotton. I, I mean, I, I would depend on the finishing. It would depend on a number of different things about the sheets. Um, for polyester, I, I would feel pretty comfortable saying um, yes. Now, a lot of sheets are, are okay, what's called OKO Tech certified to be harmless without exception. So they're not directly harmful. And I would not say that any sheets are going to be directly harmful, generally speaking, in the industry. But polyester, um, it's well known that not only does it bleed microplastics in the waterways when it's washed, but it also, if you're wearing polyester, it will shed that into the air and you breathe it in. And so there certainly, in my opinion, is something that has not been studied, um, which is the long-term health effects of breathing in petrochemical-based synthetic microfibers. That would be definitely some interesting research to see. Um, yeah, hopefully someone ends up doing that. Maybe, maybe we'll finance it. It's not a bad idea. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, tell me about kind of, uh, what, uh, kind of as an entrepreneur, some of the things that, that is important to you in terms of just kind of taking care of your own mental health and making sure that you're able to, uh, kind of perform and do what you need to do, um, to start your, com uh, companies. Um, there's different stages of it, right? I think that a lot of times people discuss their experience with mental health with a recency bias and like, you know, if you're in a good place, it's like, oh, like I wake up every morning and I do this and that. But like, you know, to look back on the journey, I think is more important for people who may be in a, in a different place or a similar, similar place. But um, so I started the company when I was 27. Um, I was, you know, pretty broke. Uh, I took a second job running an Amazon consultancy for one client on a $2,000 a month retainer. Um, to pay my bills and eat pasta every night. Um, I didn't pay myself for 18 months. I was on Cobra for 18 months and then went without healthcare for five additional months before the company got healthcare up and running. Um, and I have a really, I used to have really bad neck pain, herniated C4, C5. I still twitch a little bit. Um, used to keep me up at night, gained probably 20 or 30 pounds in building this company over the first couple of years. Um, and uh, didn't take care of myself and, uh, you know, went through a couple uh, uh, relationships ending during that time period. And, um, you know, overall, I think being a founder and being an entrepreneur has been a really long, stressful challenge for me. And, and I think that if you're not prepared to work 18 hour days for months on end, 
before anything good happens, then you're probably not ready to, to be a founder. Not that, not that I'm saying, and I'm not, not glorifying it. And I'm not saying that like, I'm better than anyone uh, at all. In fact, I think that a lot of people have come to the calculus that like, they're a lot happier <laughs> in, in like a certain line of work than, than they would be going out, you know, and doing something on their own. So uh, I don't like the hustle porn. I don't like to glorify the, you know, I work harder uh, nonsense, but like, that's kind of a, a honest look at like the first two to two, three years of the company. And the last year, you know, year three, moving into year four, um, the company stabilized a little bit. We've gotten more people working here. We're, we're growing in brand recognition. Um, we've got some operational efficiencies. And so what I've been able to do is in the last 12 months, I've refocused on my, my physical and mental health. I started going to therapy um, every week. Uh, the company paid everybody. I decided that I'd give everybody at the company 150 bucks a month for mental or physical health care. They can spend it however they want. And so for me, that meant a couple sessions with therapists. Um, and uh, so I started going to therapy. I started uh, working out every day, strengthening my back and my neck every day, sleeping at least six hours a night. Uh, I used to get only, you know, three or four hours of sleep a night when I was starting the company. Um, and you really need four at minimum, six preferably, seven and a half is ideal um, or more. And, uh, and so those are all the steps I started to take to improve my mental health and my, my physical health, which are very much intertwined. Uh, and I ended up losing about 20 pounds. I, I was sleeping more, felt better. Company was performing better, uh, delegated a bunch of, a bunch of work to, uh, to other folks who are really talented people, felt comfortable letting go of some of the responsibilities that I had traditionally held on to. Um, and the last year has been the best year of my life from a mental health and, and physical health perspective. And I feel better than I felt at any point in time in my twenties. And now I'm turning 31 next week. Awesome. Um, yeah. Well, happy early birthday. Thank you. Um, yeah. So tell me that that's a really interesting, like, in, I guess, incentive of, of giving employees that, that money to, to spend on their, their physical or uh, mental yeah. health. Have you heard any uh, feedback or, or just have you noticed anything in terms of people's kind of morale or, or work performance? I would assume just encouraging people to, to be healthier has got to do more than just you know, benefit their lives outside of work. That's got to help them to be able to kind of bring more to the company as well. Yeah, I'm sure it has. We don't, we don't have the uh, incremental measurement set up to be able to say, you know, this person was 10% more productive or anything like that. It's not, it's not that large of a company yet to have that type of, you know, operational detail. Um, you know, we, we sell, you know, thousands of, of orders a month, but we're not, uh, we're not that large of a company at this point in the grand scheme of things. So for me, it's more about, I check in with people. We have monthly meetings, everybody on the team with me. And I ask them, Hey, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Are you red, yellow, green? Um, you know, how are you, are you happy? Are you enjoying your work? Are you enjoying your life outside of work? Do you feel like you have enough time to enjoy life outside of work? Um, do you need time off? Do you, um, you know, you know, you can take it, reminding them that they can take it. When you have hard workers on the team, uh, people don't take time off for themselves. And so I really like to force people to do it. I actually doing this cool thing where I'm sending them all uh, $500 Airbnb gift cards uh, in the mail, uh, just writing them a nice little note of appreciation, because then they have that and they have to, they have to use it. They have to go somewhere. They have to do something with it. Um, so little, little hacks like that. And, um, you know, I send them gift cards and stuff and I don't know, I, I, I just like the, I'm a qualitative guy and I'm an, I'm an intuitive guy. I, and so for me, it's more about how I feel people are, are, uh, feeling. And, and so I keep really in close touch with my team's emotions and, and personal state. Awesome. Going back to the, uh, kind of talking about the company, what, uh, what's kind of like your target audience in terms of, is it because I guess my kind of assumption would be kind of the same, the same type of audience that would, you know, say buy organic foods and go to, you know, more expensive health, you know, uh, yoga studios or whatever, right. You know, people that really care about their health would kind of be the ones who gravitate towards this more environmentally sustainable sort of business. Is that, 
pretty yes. accurate? So we've got uh, heavily female, uh, heavily millennial, um, more college educated, and more affluent and more likely to have kids. And so we, we, you know, we definitely know our customer really well. Those are the demographics. Um, they're more likely to donate monthly to a charity. Uh, they're, and this, these are all uh, cross relationships with other data sets that, that we're familiar with. Um, they're more likely to uh, cook in versus eat out. Um, I'm trying to think of some other cool correlations that we found. Uh, they are they are more likely to go to a yoga studio um, um, or an outside fitness class. Um, and so, you know, we we do a lot of fun marketing stuff around that. We used to drop off hair bands at gyms because I would go to I go to Core Power Yoga, and I noticed that all the girls in the class didn't have. You know, the instructor asked me one day, "Hey, can I have your hair band?" Because we made sheets and giggles hair bands, and I was on my wrist, and I said, "Yeah," I gave it to her. And I realized that there a bunch of people had hair in their face. And so we, we, we ended up doing this campaign for all of 2019 where we would just make tens of thousands of hair bands and just go around gyms in Denver and in other cities that we had contacts in and just drop off, you know, thousands of hair bands at the front desk for people to use for free, which was cool little guerrilla marketing. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it, we, we love our customers and we know who they are and, and uh, we feel like they they you know they probably are more Seinfeld fans than they are friends and they're you know they probably grew up on SpongeBob and um you know we 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 like to think that they've got a good sense of humor at least but so we get away with some stuff that we probably couldn't get away with if we if they didn't so right on well what uh what sort of stuff do you do you look to um are you looking to uh kind of add onto the product line or like what what uh what changes can we see kind of going forward with the company? So we've actually got a really cool sustainable bedroom suite that's coming out. So I, I feel really strongly um, about, you know, uh, Sheets and Giggles being this overarching master brand for the sustainable bedroom category. And then from there, moving into sustainable home. So I actually just purchased this home. It's the first home I've ever bought. I feel very lucky, very fortunate. And um, what I'm realizing is I'm decorating it is that every single curtain is, and I, and I, and I knew, I knew this somewhat, but to see it from a firsthand customer experience perspective is really, really frustrating for me. All the curtains on the market are polyurethane, polyester, all the, all the rugs are polyurethane or wool, which is nice and sustainable. Wool's, wool's good, but a lot of them are polyurethane, the cheaper ones, especially the ones, the ones that you say, how can that beautiful incredibly soft rug be only four hundred dollars it's eight feet by ten feet it's because it's plastic it's a plastic rug um and you know uh you've got all these different um you know unsustainable towels and bath mats and there's poly and everything that you do and and uh i'm i'm just really excited to start to build out our more encompassing sustainable home suite and that starts with sustainable bedroom so we're coming out with a mattress bed frame pillows topper and protector uh, the protector will be the first one without any plastic or polyester in it, which I'm really excited about. Um, because, you know, if you buy a plastic polyester mattress cover and you have really nice sheets and you still have plastic underneath you, still it, it, it defeats the whole purpose of having nice sheets and mattress. Anyway, um, so we're coming out with that in Q1 of next year. And uh, I cannot be more excited to, uh, you know, turn Sheets and Giggles into this more holistic, uh, you know, brand. And we've been working really hard on product development. And I will never release anything unless I think it's perfect and, and, you know, top, top quality better than anything else in the market. And I'm really excited. I've got our mattress prototype in our guest room, my guest room right now. And it's absolutely fantastic. So Colin, what, what sort of advice would you, if you say you were to be able to talk to your, your younger self as a, as a beginning entrepreneur, um, what sort of, advice would you would you have for that person knowing what you know now and just with the experiences that you've had mm. um don't do white packaging <laughs> <laughs> because the ups doesn't care how beautiful your packaging is it will not arrive the same way you gave it to them um this is our packaging now it's a beautiful purple box um so i uh, that's just a, a flippant answer the the more serious answer would be uh you know just keep in mind that why you started the company, right? You didn't start this thing to, you know, kill yourself or, you know, work yourself to the bone or, 
you know, um, you start, you know, you started it as a means to an end. And that's the thing is that work is a means to an end. And it's not an end. And so to keep in mind that that the most important thing is what you're building towards and what your goals are and not the, the work in front of you to take time, smell the roses, enjoy the wins. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll be a lot happier for it. Awesome. Do you see yourself, uh, kind of in the future, like starting up any, any other businesses in the sort of, uh, sort of environmentally sustainable, uh, field, or are you going to kind of stick with, with, um, uh, with sheets and giggles as kind of your baby or just kind of these different sub sectors? That's a good question. I, I see a lot of business opportunities. I see a lot of suboptimalities in the world that are very frustrating for me. I have a lot of ideas on the software side based on how I built this business and what would make my life easier as a business owner. Um, and I think that there's a hundred percent chance I will start another company. I think that that's every investor will tell you that's why they invest in the same founders over and over again, because they get better at building the companies the next time. Um, but the, some of the things that are really killing me are the single use plastic that I see in the grocery store. I do not like the other day I saw a new product on the shelf and it's individually wrapped peeled garlic cloves. So if you can't be bothered to buy a thing of garlic, put it on your counter and take all the sheathing off and, and then, you know, have the clove, they sell individually packaged and it's plastic within plastic garlic cloves. And I wanted to blow my fucking head off. I was like, I was like, like, this is like peak American consumerism is, is individually wrapped garlic cloves. And so I, I basically like, I, I think that there's something here with, you know, every single blackberry that you eat is in a clamshell, right? Like all, you know, the mushrooms come in plastic wrapping, like every, like the bags at the grocery store are all single use plastic bags that are not plant-based, not biodegradable. And it's like, I don't know, it's, it's sometimes I'm like, what are we doing? Like what, like, like how, like how, like how have we set up this system to be, is it all about cost? It's all about that extra nickel or that extra dime. And, and so for me, I think that probably one of the next things that I really want to focus on, because we don't use any plastic in our packaging, our sheets come, you know, completely plastic free, uh, you know, wrapped in a wrap tag in a knapsack and, and we don't do any plastic or we're the only bedding company to not do that. Every other bedding company that you order from is going to have gobs of plastic to protect the sheets because they don't want any customers to have any damage. Um, and so that's something that I've been thinking about is like, there's um, uh, my- myocillin, I think it's called. It's a, it's a, a mushroom based uh, packaging that's really blowing up right now that I'm really excited about. I would love to do something with that, with the clamshell packages that you see fruit and berries come in and, and grocery stores. Um, and really just more, more along the sustainable packaging side of things, I think is, is a big next frontier. Right. It got me thinking. I mean, if, you know, it seems like definitely now is the time. I mean, people have, you know, come to really seems like for the most part care about, uh, you know, what, what it is that they're actually eating and the, you know, pesticides and, 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 you know, all the additives to the food, but, but maybe not really paying attention to how that food is actually, uh, packaged yet. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me that that would be the next frontier. People also, I'm sure you've seen, um, John Oliver did a fantastic piece on the plastic industry and plastic packaging. And um, one of the more nefarious things is that that little triangle recycle symbol actually doesn't always mean recyclable. There's a, there's a one through seven scoring system uh, with plastic packaging that is actually, it defines what type of plastic it is, if you can believe that. So the, the plastic industry lobbied to get this passed to where there's the recyclable symbol. And then if it has a number inside of it, a one, two, three, or four, five, six, seven, it means that it's home plastic. It's food plastic. It's, and so it looks recyclable. So the consumer feels as though it's going somewhere useful when they're using, they're throwing it in the recycling bin. But for 90% of plastic that gets put in the recycling bin, it doesn't, it go, ends up going into a landfill anyway. And it ends up actually making recycling less efficient. Um, because of the way that the plastic industry has lobbied 
uh, for that type of a rating system. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff in this in this space that I think is um, really suboptimal that I'm looking forward to to maybe working on in the future. Great. Well, Colin, uh, I've really enjoyed having you on the show today. Any last uh, kind of closing thoughts before we wrap up? Um, I don't know if I have any closing thoughts. I, I really enjoyed the show. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, and, and for people out there that are, uh, you know, thinking about buying sustainable products, uh, I will say that the, the best thing to do, um, you know, to encourage, uh, large systemic change. I know I, I like to make fun of the memes where it's like, you know, like, <laughs> Uh, seven companies are responsible for like, I don't know, 80% of the global pollution or something like that. It's some absurd statistic. And then it's like, you know, and, and, the, and the government's like, make sure you shut off your faucet while you brush your teeth. They're like, make sure you unplug your appliances when you leave the home. Like, you know, stuff that like, obviously isn't going to make a big impact. But I will say on the consumerist level, on an individual buying habits level, pay the extra dollar for the sustainable option. Like, go the extra mile to like buy the, the, the cage free eggs or the, you know, the, the, the small local producer or like, because what's going to end up happening is there's so much data and sophisticated data collection around consumer buying habits that when you get a large enough group of people taking an action, let's say a large enough group of people say, we will not buy products that have single use plastic in the packaging, period and they email companies and they send notes to customer service and they say, here's what we're, here's what we believe, here's what we're doing. And, and, and you put that pressure on companies, they're able to see it with their data sets that the buying behavior is shifting. And if they can get it qualitatively from their customer service email, that's a double whammy. And you will change uh, industry trends if you demand it as a, as a consumer with your dollar. But if you, if you go, and I know that not everybody can do this. I know that I'm talking from a privileged position of spend the extra dollar, spend the extra money. Obviously sometimes the cheapest option is best because it's all you can afford. I used to buy, you know, wait until pasta was on sale for 29 cents a box. And I would buy 20 boxes in order to make sure that I had, you know, 60 meals planned out. That's what I literally used to do. So I can certainly empathize and understand with people who hear what I'm saying and say, well, I can't afford to do that. I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking to you. I'm talking about millions of people living imperfectly is the way to get systemic change, not a handful of people living perfectly. And so that's what I encourage people to do is, you know, make sure that you're making choices to where even if you're living imperfectly, there's a few things that you can do uh, that'll move the needle on a, on a larger data set uh, perspective. Great. Well, Colin, thank you so much for, for sharing all of this with, with the audience here. And for those of you guys who did enjoy the show today, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for Roscoe's Wetsuit. Also, if you did enjoy the show, go ahead and leave us a five-star Apple uh, podcast review. That would be greatly appreciated. You can find audio versions of the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and just about anywhere else that audio podcasts are available. Again, Colin, thank you so much. Thanks, Toby. I appreciate it. And great name for the podcast, by the way. I love it.